Okay. Well, it's an honor to be with you here tonight. We're able to make it out, and uh, as well as anybody who's watching online, and the, the committee for the Gap Center for inviting me uh, to come speak on the Angel of the Lord, which is a, a subject that I love to talk about because it glorifies our Savior Jesus. And if you're a Christian, you love him. Uh, we love to see him glorified. Amen. Uh, so it's good to be with you here tonight. Uh, just a brief introduction, uh, because I'm probably unknown to almost all of you. Uh, my name is Matt Foreman. I do pastor Faith Reformed Baptist Church in Media, Pennsylvania, which is western suburbs of Philadelphia. I've been pastor there since 2002. And um, my wife was going to join us this evening, but uh, she had to stay home because of some issues with one of our kids that came up, uh, but she might be here in the morning. Uh, at least that's my hope. So uh, our messages this weekend are going to be a little bit more uh, biblical theology lecture format, uh, going into a little more theological detail than I would in a typical sermon. Our topic is the angel of the Lord and particularly the identification of the angel in the Old Testament as a manifestation of God the Son, which is really the historic Christian tradition from the earliest days of the church. Uh, Christians have believed that the person of Jesus was not just prophesied and pictured in the Old Testament, but was actively there, revealed in his person by his presence. And I want to begin tonight with a historical illustration of that truth. In the year 268 AD, so very, very early in church history, in the city of Antioch, there was a bishop by the name of Paul of Samosata. And Paul of Samosata was one of the early, became one of the early heretics of the church. Uh, he had begun teaching what was really an early form of Unitarianism and Monarchianism. And in particular, he was teaching that Jesus was simply a man who became infused with the divine logos. So that Jesus was a, a story of a man becoming divine, not of God becoming man. And in 268, the, the controversy about Paul of Samosata's teachings was just beginning to grow, and a group of six bishops got together, led by the bishop of Jerusalem, a man named Hymenaeus, and they wrote Paul a letter that's become known in history, the letter of six bishops to Paul of Samosata. And in this letter, they were seeking to understand his views and also seeking to lay out what was the orthodox understanding of the churches. And in the beginning of the letter, they write, it seemed good to us to set forth a written account concerning the faith we received from the beginning that has been handed down and maintained in the universal and holy church until this very day, received from the blessed apostles. And they, they begin to go on writing about the identity of God the Son. They write this son, begun the one and only Son, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, the wisdom and word and power of God, existing before the ages, not as, but as to being and nature God, we confess and preach, having to acknowledge this from both the Old and New Testament. And what they begin to do in the letter is they begin to trace how the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament was the revelation of God the Son. And they trace through things like Genesis 16 and 18 and 19 and 22 and 32 and Exodus 3 and Exodus 33 and numerous other passages to say that these were the clear revelation of God the Son. And this is, they say, the universal understanding of the churches handed down by the apostles themselves. And they end the letter basically saying, we want to know if you agree. In other words, they, they viewed this understanding 
as practically a creedal confession among the early churches as to how to understand Jesus in the Old Testament and as part of the argument for Jesus' pre-incarnate divinity. Now, unfortunately, it has seemed to me that that understanding, that conviction of Christ's real presence in the Old Testament has become somewhat muted, really only in the last 200 or so years of history. Um, And it's really an anomaly when you look at the 1,800 years prior to that in terms of how Christians were reading their Old Testament. There's actually a just as a, a small example of this, it's maybe an unfair example. There, there's a great book on the Trinity by, by British theologian Michael Reeves called Delighting in the Trinity. It's a terrific introduction to the Trinity. I highly recommend it. My one criticism of the book, when he talks about the revelation of the Trinity, and particularly the revelation of Christ, he doesn't mention a single Old Testament passage. And if you were to go back and read the early church fathers in their development of the doctrine of the Trinity, they were doing the exact opposite and were constantly talking about Christ being revealed in the Old Testament. And yet people shy away from that today. Many Christians today, even Christian theologians, tend to read the Old Testament as if it's about a monistic God, a monad God. And and the assumption is that that the Jewish religion believed in a strict monism. Christians will say that we know that, that God has always been a Trinitarian God, but they act like, or tend to act like, it wasn't revealed until the New Testament, and they're often hesitant to see it in the Old Testament at all. And that was basically how I thought about the Old Testament for many years. You know, I, I believe that there were possible glimpses of the Trinity in the Old Testament, but for the most part, the Old Testament gives us a strictly monistic view of God. Because of that, I don't know if you ever had this reaction, for the longest time it, it seemed strange to me, given that assumption, that the New Testament almost seems to assume the Trinity. The New Testament doesn't seem to spend that much direct time on it. It doesn't even really seem to be that bothered by the idea. It seems to take the disciples a while to realize that Jesus was the pre-incarnate, eternal Son of God, pre-existent eternal Son of God. But when they do realize it, it's like they buy it hook, line, and sinker and seem to say that they should have understood that in the first place. And that always seemed strange to me, that they didn't spend more time working out the idea of the Trinity. What I've finally come to understand over the last few years is that they weren't that surprised. And the idea that God could be one and more than one was not an unusual idea to the Jews in the first century. In fact, many Jews accepted the idea that God was one and more than one, and they accepted it because the Old Testament taught it. And I'm not exaggerating this. There's actually been a lot of scholarship done in the last few decades, including by Jewish scholars, showing that prior to the first century, there was a significant strand of Jewish theology that was was talking about a multiplicity in God. Uh, Some of them will talk about two powers in heaven or a Yahweh in heaven and a Yahweh manifested on earth. Um, What's interesting is that that theology, that Jewish theology of a multiplicity in God became heresy among the Jewish rabbis in the second century. Any any guesses why it became heresy? It's because so many Jews were becoming Christians because of this idea. But where did they get the idea in the first place? And the answer is, they got it from the Bible. And it's something we're going to see this weekend all over the place in the Old Testament. And and the place I want to start this evening is in Exodus 23. So if you have your your Bible this evening, I invite you to turn to Exodus 23. 
It's actually here in Exodus 23 when I was preaching through Exodus a number of years ago that this really began to sink in for me and, and I began to see how big this idea was in the Old Testament. And it's my conviction that as Christians we need to relearn how to read our Old Testament. We need to relearn some of the interpretive tradition of the church. We need to relearn how our Savior Jesus was not just revealed in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament. And he's not just pictured and predicted in the Old Testament, he's acting there. And the center of God's revelation has always been centered on God the Son. And so I want to begin this evening, we're, we're going to look at three foundational passages opening session that show the sweeping storyline of my angel in the Old Testament. Exodus 23, verse 20, reads this way. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. When my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I blot them out, you shall not bow down to their gods or serve them or do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. You shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from you. None shall miscarry or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my terror before you. And will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites from before you. I will not drive them out before you in one year, lest the land become desolate, desolate and the wild beasts multiply against you. Little by little I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and possessed the land. And I will set your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines, and from the wilderness to the Euphrates, for I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them and their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. Now before we go on, I, I, wanna, I would like to, to pray in response to... Um, the reading of God's Word, just asking for His blessing as we, as we study it tonight. <clears throat> Father in heaven, I thank you for this opportunity to give attention to your Word, and I pray that you would open our minds and our hearts to see the revelation of your goodness in the great promise and gift of your Son, Jesus, that was begun to be revealed in the Old Testament and was finally consummated in His becoming man and taking on flesh, and going in our place to the cross. Uh, grow us in our appreciation and understanding and love for him tonight. We need your Spirit's help so that we respond appropriately to your word. We pray in your name. Amen. Now you'll notice this passage I just read is, is basically the ending promise of the Sinai Covenant. From Exodus 20 through 23... It, it's really the foundational revelation of the Sinai Covenant, beginning with the Ten Commandments and then the explanation of the law. You'll notice chapter 24 is the covenant confirmation ceremony where Moses and the elders of Israel make the sacrifices that seal the covenant. And so this passage at the end of 23 is the concluding promise of the covenant where God says he will send his angel before them to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place he has prepared. Now, what you need to understand is this idea of an angel going with them was not a new thing. You have to remember, you go back to Exodus 3, the story of the burning bush. It was the angel of the Lord who appeared to the people out of the burning bush. 
Uh, It was an angel who brought them out of Egypt. That sounds weird to us, but but in Numbers 2016, Moses says, When we cried to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. It was an angel that appeared to them on Mount Sinai and thundered from the mountain. In fact, the New Testament writers knew this. The the martyr Stephen, when he makes his speech in Acts, speaks of the angel that appeared to Moses. And and you could trace this back further than than the Exodus. We're not going to look that much tonight at Genesis, but you go through Genesis and the divine angel appears repeatedly in Genesis. In Genesis 48, 15, Jacob famously says, as he's blessing Joseph's sons, he says, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my long life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless these boys. And in that passage in Genesis 48, Jacob implies that the God who has been guiding him and and leading him and that he wants to bless him is also the angel of God sent to him. Now, that leads a lot of people to say, that's really weird. Um, What does that really mean? Who is this angel really? The the word angel, in, in Hebrew, it's the word malach. It can, it usually, it can be just literally translated as messenger. And it can be used in the Bible for all kinds of messengers, for human messengers sometimes, but often in the Bible for some type of supernatural angelic being. The Bible tells us there are a multitude of heavenly angels. So some commentators looking here at Exodus 23 have said that maybe this is just talking about a human messenger. This is talking about Moses or Joshua. Or maybe it's talking about some kind of lower level angel. But what I'm going to try to show you tonight is that this is clearly not an ordinary angel. There are ordinary angels that God sends at times. This is not one of them. The way this angel is described is intimately connected with Yahweh. Look at verse 21. It says, pay careful attention to him. The the literal translation would be, beware the face of him and obey his voice. Because God says, strangely, this angel has authority to pardon or not to pardon their sins. He holds the prerogative of forgiveness. As John Gill points out, it would be absurd to say he will not pardon if he could not pardon. That such an angel could forgive sins that that only God could do anyway. Mark 2, 7, who can forgive sins but God alone? And, And then God says, at the end of verse 21, for my name is in him. And if you know anything about the Exodus, you should know that God's name is crucially important. God's name is an expression of his being and character. Back back in the burning bush, God had revealed his name to Moses. And if you go back and read Exodus 3, it was actually the angel of Yahweh in the burning bush who had revealed the name of Yahweh. And in the Old Testament, God's name becomes almost a representation of God, a personification of God. Listen to sometimes how this is used. Isaiah 30, 27, Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with his anger. Or Psalm 20, may the name of the God of Jacob protect you. Some trust in chariots and others in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. God, God's name is is an entire expression of his person. If If I were to jump forward a little bit, you think about Jesus in the New Testament saying to his disciples, I have manifested your name to the people you gave me out of the world. Jesus' disciples who were well, you know, decently well-trained Jews knew that someone who manifested the name of God was someone special. Then, Then look at verse 22. It says, but if you will carefully obey his voice and do all that I say... 
Okay, there, there's a connection, therefore, between the voice of the angel, what the angel says, and what God says. And as the text continues, God is going to continue to move back and forth between what he will do and what the angel will do. Look at verse 23. When my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, Jebusites, and I blot them out, you shall not bow down to their gods or serve them or do as they do. You shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. Look at verse 25. You shall serve Yahweh your God and he will bless your bread and your water and I will take sickness away from you. You, you notice the change of subjects there? Amazingly, it's like the angel is now just called Yahweh your God. There's a blurring here of identity that the way the angel is described becomes virtually inseparable from Yahweh himself. The people were to give him the kind of obedience and respect owed to God himself. This is not the first time something like this has happened. If you were to keep your finger here at 23 and go back to Exodus 15. Um, Exodus 15 verse 26 is the, the verse where, where God has Moses throw the log into the water to make the bitter water sweet. Verse 26 says, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His eyes and give ear to His commandments and keep all His statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am Yahweh your healer. Um, you know, if you were just thinking about yourself, you could think, well, that's just a weird, maybe Hebrew way of switching subjects. But you put this together with something like Exodus 23, where it's obviously talking about two different persons in some sense, then it's suggested that with those, those times happen elsewhere, there may be something deeper going on. As Phil Riken says, the, this angelic messenger is both distinguished from God yet at the same time has uniquely divine attributes. The identity of Yahweh and the angel are intimately connected. Even back in 23, in verse 27, when he says, I will send my terror before you. That's probably a reference not just to God being a terror, but to the angel of God being a terror. Uh, we have verses like Psalm 34, it says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. That's a very comforting verse. Psalm 35 says something very scary in contrast. Speaking of God's enemies, it says, let them be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. So the angel of the Lord is both the promised protector and deliverer of the people and he's the one who strikes terror into their enemies and drives them away. So do you begin to see what's happening here in Exodus 23? As part of his covenant blessing, God gives his people a final promise to send with them a special angel who mediates the very presence of Yahweh. If they listen to him and obey his voice, he will guide them and guard them and fight for them against their enemies. He will be with them wherever they go. They are to follow and obey Him only. They must not worship the gods of the nations or enter into, the covenant with, enter into a covenant with their gods, for God says they will surely be a snare to you. Some people might say this is really the, the ultimate promise and warning of the covenant. The warning part becomes really important because of where I want to take you next. So now turn with me over to Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. Judges 2 happens probably 50 or 60 years later after the time of Joshua, after Israel had entered the promised land, had begun to drive out the nations of the land, but had ultimately failed to drive them out. And we're told this, Judges 2, verse 1. 
Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. Now, like what happens so often in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord kind of appears here in Judges 2 without any comment or any introduction. We're simply told the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim. So to situate your minds a little bit, Gil- Gilgal was the place Israel first camped when they came to land, before the battle of Jericho. And Gilgal actually became the staging ground for the entire conquest of Canaan. It was where they'd first sacrificed to the Lord in the land, where they'd been circum- recircumcised and the covenant had been renewed. And so the angel leaving Gilgal was kind of a sign of God leaving the camp, a sign of his displeasure. But, but then notice what he says, because the language is almost a direct echo of everything we saw in Exodus 23. Remember, he said, I'll send an angel before you to guard you on the way to bring you to the place I have prepared. Here the angel says, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you to the land I swore to give to your fathers. God had said in Exodus 23, pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Here the angel says, but you have not obeyed my voice. He said, don't make covenants with their gods, break their altars in pieces. Here he's saying, you didn't do it. And so now, just like I warned you, my blessing is being withdrawn, and their gods will be a snare to you. Are you seeing all these parallels? Here is this angel speaking now as both the God of Israel and the angel of the covenant. And he's reminding them of both the promise and the warning of Exodus 23. And because of their disobedience, the warning is now coming to pass. And the promise of the angel's assured blessing is being withdrawn. See why they lifted up their voices and wept. Now, obviously, the angel of Exodus 23 can't be Moses or Joshua, right? But it also can't be some lesser angel. You know, there are other angels that come from God in the Old Testament. You, not every time you see an angel of the Lord is it necessarily the divine angel. You have to figure out in context what's going on. Um, there are scholars who have tried to argue that a royal representative could speak with the king's authority and expect that his words be received. Therefore, they, they say that an, an angel could be identified as Yahweh and not be Yahweh. But speaking with the king's authority is not the same as being identified with the king, right? When the Apostle Paul says in the New Testament, you received my words not as the words of men, but as they really were as the words of God, did Paul mean they should identify him with God? No. Um, And actually, there's other scholars... uh, One scholar by the name of Samuel Meyer says that the angel of the Lord passages are the only texts in biblical and ancient Near Eastern literature where no distinction is made between the sender and the messenger. Although messengers sometimes speak in the first person as if they were the senders of the message, they normally report who sent them. The angel of Yahweh in these perplexing narratives does not behave like any other messenger known in the divine or human realm. It is evident that the angel of Yahweh is closely associated with Yahweh in name, authority, and message, that he represents Yahweh in the human realm, whereas Yahweh himself is actualized in realms outside human perception. Yet this angel, we're going to see, receives worship, speaks as Yahweh himself, is identified as the appearance 
of Yahweh himself, bears God's special name, has Yahweh's authority to redeem and judge. He was both sent from God and was God. How could the Old Testament present us with a being who is both sent from God and was God? Could this be a revelation of the Son in the Old Testament? If you're a Christian, why would we think any differently? You say, okay, but is there any explicit reason to see this angel as Jesus? And the answer to that brings us to, to our last passage that I think connects a lot of these dots and shows where the story is going. Turn over to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi 3, the very end of the Old Testament. In in Malachi 3, the people of Israel have returned from exile in Babylon. They've rebuilt Jerusalem and the temple. But it wasn't what they hoped. The glory promised had not returned. The Messiah had not come. The people were struggling with disappointment and cynicism and unbelief. But in in Malachi 3, excuse me, God responds to their complaints with a prophecy that the glory is coming, but it's not going to be what they expect. Malachi 3.1 says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire And like fuller's soap, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Now now you'll notice in verse 1 that there are two messengers there. Um, And the word in both cases is the word malach. It's, It's our word we're talking about, angel. And just like I told you a few minutes ago, a messenger can be either human or supernatural, depending on the context. And in this case, the first messenger, he says, is going to be a herald who will prepare the way for God's coming. When When a king would visit a royal city, when a king would make a royal visit to a city, a royal messenger would come to prepare the way for the king's coming, smooth out the roads, make for a glorious welcome, And the people of Israel had heard before about this messenger who comes to prepare the way. In Isaiah 40, Isaiah had promised about a voice in the wilderness who would prepare the way of the Lord and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And here now God is repeating that promise of a messenger who would prepare the way. Malachi later identifies this messenger in chapter 4, verse 5, He says, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. As you probably know, the New Testament explicitly identifies that first messenger with who? John the Baptist. But then notice what it says next. He will prepare the way way before me. And then the Lord, it's lowercase Lord there, so it's not the, the, the... Tetragrammaton Yahweh, it's the Adon, the Adonai. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger or angel of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts. So notice the, the progression of thought here. The first messenger comes to prepare the way before me, but then a second figure is promised whose appearing will be unexpected, he'll come suddenly. He's called the Adonai whom you seek, who comes to what could be called his temple. And so it's a figure coming in God's place, whose coming is also God's coming, and God calls him the angel of the covenant in whom you delight. What angel of the covenant is he talking about? 
if, if you knew these connected the dots in the Old Testament, you would know it's, it's this angel who had descended in glory on the tabernacle and the temple at the time of Moses, time of Solomon. It's the angel who led the people in the wilderness. It's the angel who was the last promise of the Sinai covenant, God's crowning glory of his promises, the angel of his presence who reveals God and is God. In in Malachi's time, the temple had been rebuilt, but God had not descended in fire and cloud like with the older temple and temple. The angel of the covenant who had walked with their fathers, who'd rescued the people out of Egypt, who'd given the covenant promises, who dwelt in the temple, had not appeared. But God ends the Old Testament with the promise that he will come. He will come and do a work, but it will not be the work that they expected. You know, from a New Testament perspective, he's, he's not going to do a work of military triumph, a national prosperity. Instead, he's going to come and it's going to be a time of spiritual refinement and purification for worship. Have you ever noticed that the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10.9 says that the people of the Old Testament were grumbling against Christ when they grumbled in the desert? Have you ever noticed the book of Jude, verse 5, says, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus saved a people out of the land of Egypt and afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Have you ever wondered where the Apostle John got the idea In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made known. Did you ever ever think at the transfiguration, when Jesus' glory was displayed on the mountain, the cloud descended, and the Father said, This is my Son, Listen to him, that he was echoing Exodus 23, 21, pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. You think about Jesus' great commission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What was Jesus saying? He was reinstituting the promise of Exodus 23, now on the basis of a better covenant that he would be with us and never leave us or forsake us and take us where he has prepared a place. Phil Riken writes, like the Israelites, we have received salvation. We've crossed the sea from death to life through the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but we have not yet reached the promised land, and the way is long and hard. We must endure many trials and suffer many sorrows in the journey of our faith, but God has given us a guardian Savior who will lead us where we need to go. Jesus will protect us from danger along the way. If we listen to his word, he will tell us everything we need to know. And in the end, he will lead us home to God. One of my favorite hymns says, I've found a friend, oh, such a friend. All power to him is given to guard me on my onward course and lead me safe to heaven. This is the story of the whole Bible. And from beginning to end, it is about the revelation of Jesus as God's best promise to us. Jesus, who is God with us, is the first and last and best promise. And even today, we need to hear his voice, follow him, trust him, because he's the one who's already defeated our greatest enemy and has gone to prepare a place for us. Amen? Let's have a word of prayer.
Father, like the people of Israel, we need a mediator who will be with us even when we fall short, who knows that we need to be rescued not just from slavery in Egypt, but slavery to sin. And we thank you that the Old Testament promised a time to come when when you would send that angel in a brand new, better and glorious way to bring us a final salvation and to fulfill all of your promises. We, We pray, Father, that we would see and hear and listen to the voice of our Savior Jesus and follow him and that he, know that he reveals the name and glory of the father we pray in his name amen